Thanks for being here tonight. Um, I, my name is Sean Beckett. I'm the staff naturalist here. Um, I hear the speaker tonight is great, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, <laughs> I get to introduce myself. Um, before we get started, though, uh, a couple of announcements is North Branch is going to Yellowstone with me in uh, the end of May, May 20th to 27th, and there's one space left on the trip. So if you aren't already convinced that Yellowstone's an amazing place, you will be convinced in uh, an hour from now. So keep that in the back of your mind if uh, it's all of this gets you really excited to head out in the wilderness. Um, so in addition to being the naturalist here, um, I come here from having worked as a, a wolf guide in Yellowstone Park for years, and I still go back there every year to lead a couple trips. I'll be heading out there next week for the better part of the month to lead winter uh, wolf watching expeditions out in the park. Um, so before we, we dive into the story, um, a couple of um, announce, I guess, announcements related to this is that there are some pictures and graphic images of, of carcasses and that kind of thing. Um, if I remember, I will tell you in advance of, of those when they come up, but just be forewarned. Nothing too crazy, but, um, but you know, there, there's a little bit of blood here and there. Um, and the other thing I want to apologize for up front is that I'm going to get your political hackles up. And, and that's only because I've been talking about wolves for years and years, and I've realized that there's no way to talk about these animals effectively without it eventually touching on politics here and there. And I'm the last person in the world that likes to talk about politics and religion and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's like not, you know, not okay dinner time conversation. Um, and so just know that when, when, you're, when you feel your hackles getting up, um, I'm doing that intentionally for a reason and selectively. And so just know that I'm, I'm, I'm throwing those punches um, very selectively throughout for, for particular reasons. So just, just trust that if your hackles go up, they'll hopefully go back down. And, uh, and I have a method to that in that. Okay. Um, and the last announcement, too, is that um, this isn't really going to be a talk about biology and figures. And, and you know, I'm not going to be up here with using my background as a you know wildlife scientist necessarily because you can't tell the story of wolves without really speaking to their emotions and the decisions that they make all the reasons why wolves and humans are really similar and so you know my biology teachers you know growing up and going through school you know would always say you know we just we can't anthropomorphize how can we know that this animal is feeling love or joy or sadness or sorrow or all these other animals or all these other emotions um, and then you see a wolf and you realize there's no way to actually uh, describe what's going on without drawing on those those sorts of emotions um, and those sorts of descriptions i think our biggest failing perhaps or one of them as, as a human species is thinking that we have the monopoly on this wide range of uh, intentions and feelings and emotions and spans of, of perceptions and all these things that we call human. Well, animals are, a lot of animals are doing this all the time, as you'll see. So just, um, just I guess my warning there is I'm going to anthropomorphize a lot, so just deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just the light switch on the right hand. Tonight's really about storytelling. It's about telling the stories of uh, these amazing animals, all the things that they do, all the, the um, controversies that happen in order to get them to the Yellowstone landscape in the first place. Um, and this is a story that's going to be in, in several different parts. Um, part one is going to be just introducing you into this ecosystem where these animals live and kind of setting, setting the stage. <coughs> 
and, uh, and, and having you join me on, on, a, on a wolf watching trip uh, out in Yellowstone. The, the second part of the story is the story of our relationship with these animals over the years and, and how, uh, how our feelings about them have really spanned the spectrum of, of the worst of the worst to the best of the best and just our relationship with wolves. The third part is going to be about the reintroduction about the monumental moment in 1995 when we decided to put wolves back onto the western landscape and um, how that worked and why that, why that happened. And then the last part of this story is the story of the saga of a particular wolf dynasty in Yellowstone and tracking the lives of a particular family of wolves from the very reintroduction all the way up until about two weeks ago and, um, and showing the dramatic differences in personalities and, and life stories of, of these animals. So, so that's that's what we got going on. Um, so where we're talking about is a place called the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. This is an area that is really big. The Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem is the largest intact ecosystem in the lower 48. It is 18 million acres large. And to put that in perspective, Vermont plus New Hampshire plus Massachusetts is a little bit less than 18 million acres. Um, it's a tremendous amount of space. So right here, and this is the, the north, this is the state of Wyoming. You have Montana to the north, Idaho to the west, and this is what we call the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. It's kind of this blob I'm putting over here. It has within it Yellowstone National Park. And then this piece and dark green attached to it is Grand Teton National Park, it makes it about three million, three million acres. And surrounding that is all sorts of national forests and BLM lands and other sorts of public land and private lands. Um, but but you know it's it's all fine to look at a map, but but this is what it really looks like. This is what this landscape looks like. It is really big and it is wild. And it's a place that's big enough to house our imaginations. Right? Um, it wasn't that long ago that Westerners actually figured out that this place existed, right? Lewis and Clark, when they were moving across the West in 1803, they kind of sidestepped this ecosystem. There was a point where they could look south and they could see some of these mountains from where their travels were, and they just thought, oh, I wonder what's over there. And it wasn't another 80 years until a government expedition actually came in and, and you know, surveyed this area. So it's huge. So if you think about what it was like to, when, when explorers were, were you know, charting maps of the world, um, what did they do when they came across areas that they hadn't been to? They had to map places they hadn't been. What do you draw on that map? Well, that's where you put your imagination, right? The blank spaces on our world maps um, used to be full of dragons and unicorns and palaces and, and you know, kingdoms that were just totally imaginary, places where rivers ran with gold, all of this kind of stuff, right? And, and this, is, this is one of those places, right? This is a blank spot on the map where we put our imagination. And the thing about Yellowstone is what's actually there is sometimes crazier than what our imagination can actually become, <laughs> right? Places where water is rocketing out of the ground, boiling hundreds of feet in the air, where steam clouds rise half a mile high, right? Where the churning of boiling water under your feet actually feels, you know, you can feel the vibration of that. It, it sounds like you're in the middle of a combustion engine, right? <clears throat> Places where fur trappers back in the day would say that it's so wild and the mountains were so tall that if you were a bird, you'd better bring a lunch if you were going to fly over the <laughs> <laughs> And it's a place where as Lewis and Clark were traveling out and were at the, western, at the foothills of the Rockies, they looked around at massive herds of bison that were so numerous that they called them, quote, the moving multitude that darkened the plains. Mm -hmm. And so, um, also in those blank spots on the map, that's where you put the things that we'd rather not think about. The, play, the things that we think don't really belong in the mapped places, we put them there. The things that are our fears, the pieces of ourselves that we wish we didn't really have, right? Um, the things that, that don't belong, we, we, we kind of squirrel away on these unmarked places on the map. And that's, uh, so it's very fitting that this ecosystem is the place where we we go to to talk about and think about wolves and the landscape. And what I think is remarkable about this Yellowstone ecosystem about wolves is that you know, nowadays we have this itch to, 
to see reality, to really understand what's real, right? We have all these layers of technology and you know, economics and politics and this and that and all the other things that go on in our day to day. And sometimes it's hard to remember what's beneath all of that, what's really down at the core um, of all that. And that's, and that's what people find when they come here um, to this place and particularly when they, when they see this animal. These are animals that are living wild and living raw wild lives. <laughs> So, um, so welcome to our you know, Yellowstone wolf watching expedition. Um, I want to introduce you to somebody else that's on the trip with us. Her name is Carol. And Carol is a woman from Ohio. And Carol is 77 years old. And Carol, um, her, she worked, before she retired, she worked her whole life as a kindergarten teacher. And Carol, her, her, her mission um, in her, her work, one of them was to paint wolves as the protagonists instead of the antagonists. So she had you know, stuffed wolves in her classroom, she incorporated wolves into the stories and the activities that kids did, and after she retired, she wrote children's books about wolves, where the wolves are the good guys, right? Well, Carol got some really unfortunate um, medical news, and she learned that she wasn't going to really be able to be around for a heck of a lot longer. And though Carol had been a lifelong advocate of wolves, she had never seen a wolf in the wild. And so she spent every last night of her life savings to come on a wolf watching trip to try to see a wolf in the wild here in Yellowstone. And so we traveled around this ecosystem. Um, of that 18 million acres, we were kind of focusing in on about 3 million acres of that that we spent seven days. A monumental landscape, absolutely massive, absolutely frigid. You think it's cold outside right now? Um, yesterday in Yellowstone, in, at where this shot was taken, it was 30 degrees below zero. <laughs> That's like a regular day for a wolf, too. Um, so massive landscape. And we had been out for four days, five days, six days. We had seen all sorts of amazing things. We had seen things like magpies riding on the back of the bison. We had seen um, you know, bighorn sheep ramming their heads together. We had seen bison snow climbing through four feet of snow. We had seen otters and coyotes pouncing on stuff and foxes and all this. But we hadn't seen a wolf. And it was uh, approaching the last day of the entire trip. And so the, the last morning, um, we wake up. And at the end of the day, we're going to end up at the airport to go home. And this is our last shot to see wolves. And we wake up, and it is a howling blizzard. And the visibility is zero. right? And so Carol is crushed. I, of course, am crushed. Um, and so we head out into the Lamar Valley, which is um, one of the major spots that people go to look at the wolves. And we waited and waited and waited for the weather to clear just a little bit. And when the weather cleared, we noticed that there were these tracks um, in the ground that crossed the road and headed off towards the backside of this, uh, or to the foothills of these, these mountains. And as the weather cleared, um, we looked the distance, we saw two ravens, one coming in from the left, one coming in from the right, and they landed in the same place. And we put up our spotting scopes on that, and we saw this wolf. Um, 926 was her name, 926. <laughs> uh, so I should mention that. So Remember I said I was going to anthropomorphize a lot, right? Well, biologists, when they radio collar a wolf, they, it, it's, it's given a number. And that number is kind of co-opted by people who follow these wolves, and that just kind of becomes this name. Just like my name is Sean, that wolf's name is 926. Um, and, uh, and, you know, biologists give numbers to animals so that they just, we think of them as units in a population where this animal is the same as that animal, it's just, you know, all numbers. That doesn't work with wolves. So this wolf's name is 926. Um, and I'll be using a lot of numbers today, so um, it's not to bore you with math or anything, it's that these wolves have names that we use to, to um, keep track of who's who, and this is 926. Anywho, so 926 um, is the alpha female of this pack called the Lamar Canyon Pack, and we got to watch them leave this carcass. We only saw them for a few minutes, but um, that any sighting of a wolf in the wild is a remarkable sighting. Um, this is something that most people don't ever get to see. Uh, so, you know, the snow is still coming down a little bit. Every so often we have to go and we have to uh, take our uh, cloths, we have to brush the, the snow off the spotting scopes. The Carol scope, we have to go over and we have to wipe tears off the eye. The, the eye <laughs> um, so, uh, we headed out, we headed home. This wolf 926 is my favorite wolf. 
And um, I have one frame photograph of a wolf in our house, and it's of 926 when she was a year old. Because this wolf has saved me just like this on so many uh, uh, wildlife watching excursions where it's the last day of a trip. And you know, we've been looking and looking and looking, glassing the, the, the hills forever. I mean, we're looking over the course of three million acres for what amounts to about 30 or 40 wolves that are between, you know, four or five packs. Um, imagine looking across all of northern Vermont for 40 coyotes, right? Um, it's, it's not easy. And, you know, I'm not a particularly, like, spiritual or religious person necessarily, but 926 has really made me think long and hard about what's out there because um, because she is she is, is is karma in a nutshell. You know she appears for people who really deserve to see her and, and, and put in her you know their work to, to see a wolf and they're there for the right reasons, right? So that's our that's our first part. That's our wolf watching trip to Yellowstone. Um, so that's how Carol responded to this situation of seeing a wolf in the wild. And you know, for probably most of you, and for me, that's a really beautiful story. It's amazing to, to witness her reaction to that, uh, to have such a glowing, positive reaction to seeing this animal in the wild. Because a wolf is a lot more than just its fur, right? It's more than the sum of its parts. It's everything else that is combined into this, that, that, um, that uh, you know, all of the, the sentiment that people have had around wolves over the years is all wrapped up into this 120 pound animal, right? <coughs> So everybody's got an opinion about wolves, and that's their biggest problem. <laughs> um, so, right, of course, Western Native American tribes, a lot of them feel that uh, wolves are kind of their spirit brothers. They recognize that, uh, that wolves hunt the same thing that we do. They hunt the elk, they hunt the bison, right? And not only do they do we share the same prey as them, but we also share a lot of the same um, faults and the same tendencies, and watching wolves long enough, you realize that, oh, I recognize what that wolf is doing in my own family or something like that. And so this, 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 was, not, this was not lost on Native American tribes. But that was not necessarily the case with Westerners, right? with, with, your, with Western Europeans. Um, from the very beginning, wolves were seen in Western cultures as literally the Antichrist. Right? Um, from, from you know, all the way back, wolves are seen as, as literally the embodiment of Satan, as, as the devil's dogs, right? All the things that we don't like about our, ourselves, we have scapegoated into wolves. I don't understand that phrase scapegoat because for, for, you know, all re for all reasons, it should be scape wolf is the you know, yeah, yeah, term. Um, so starting in the beginning, you know, we had so much animosity towards wolves. And that, um, that came with us when we landed on this continent and started spreading you know, westward um, as Americans, settling the plains and settling the prairies, right? And so we systematically eradicated wolves from, from the United States, from this landscape. And it was done for a bunch of reasons. The first one was an extension of our manifest destiny, right? Um, <laughs> where we were moving on the heels of the Homestead Acts, we were heading out west, we were setting up shop, um, you know, raising cattle, proving up land, building homesteads and farmsteads and cabins you know, across the west, and cattlemen were complaining that it was far too hard to, to raise livestock in a landscape full of all these predators. And so cattlemen killed off every single wolf that, was, that, that you know, they, they could find, and government officials were hired to go out there and trap and kill all of the rest, right? So it was, it was seen as an opportunity uh, for us to stake a claim to, and, and to uh, pacify the wilderness, to kill up all these predators, make it easier for us to live there. Right? So that was kind of the original reason why which we were eradicating wolves off the landscape. Um, but it went farther than that. You might recognize this hat here, or that type of hat. That's a National Park Service flat cap. Right? Um, so, um, it, back in those days, in the late 1800s, all the way through the mid 1900s, um, our understanding of ecology was essentially non-existent. We didn't think about um, ecosystems and systems and, and how one animal influences another. We thought that you know what could be better if we, if we want to be good stewards of elk, say, or bighorn sheep or bison. What could be better for an elk than not getting eaten by a wolf? Right? And so we thought it was an act of good stewardship and good, and good shepherding of our natural resources to kill off 
as many predators as possible, right? And, um, and this is a field and stream uh, cover from 1955, which is, is not that all that long ago for our attitudes around ecology to be so wildly different. The term ecology didn't really even come onto the radar screen until the 60s. Um, this is a really famous photo of the very last wolves to set foot in Yellowstone Park for over 70 years. Um, because the National Park Service uh, has their duty to, to manage that landscape to what we thought was the right way to do things, was to kill off all the predators and to kill off all the wolves. And so this is the last litter of pups. The adults, the, the, um, the adults of this pack were already killed off. The pups were rounded up and they were brought off to slaughter. But before being slaughtered, they brought them to the Mammoth Hot Springs Visitor Center in the northwest corner of the park, which is what this building is behind it. Uh, behind this building is a park supervisor. And, um, and you know, the public was allowed to play with these wolf pups all day before they were, they were taken away. These are the very last wolves in Yellowstone. This picture was taken, I think, in 1926 to the So the, other, the fascinating thing, I think, um, about all this is not so much that we were killing wolves, but the way in which we were doing it. And this is where we're going to be a couple of pictures that might get your hackles up a little bit. Apologize for that. Um, so no other animal in the history of the world has received the same level of vengeance. Um, and no animals had, had so much hatred and animosity applied towards them as wolves. It's not good enough to kill them, but you have to make them suffer. Right? Um, and so there were all sorts. And right, these are animals, again, were embodiments of the devil, of, of you know, all the things that we hated. In, you know, these, were, these, were, these were evil animals. And so by making them suffer, this is payback for what they had done to the elk and all the things that they had eaten over, over the course of their lives, right? So it's not that they were just shot and trapped, but they were shot in the guts so that they would you know, die slowly over the course of a week. Their, their carcasses that they took down were baited with strychnine, so they would die of violent deaths from neurotoxin. Um, the pups were used as bait to catch the adults. They would put pups in, in, in you know, as bait in big you know, neck traps to catch the adults that were trying to get them out. They would uh, bait fish hooks with meat and put it outside the den so the pups would swallow the fish hooks. Um, they would blow the lower jaws off these wolves. They would wire them shut. Um, all this sentiment, too, was happening all the way through the 50s, right? So after we got back from World War II, a lot of the soldiers who had been fighting the Nazis um, over the, you know, in that theater, came back. Many of them worked for the government after their, their service in the format of these game management agencies, the Park Service, the Forest Service, or whatever. And when they went out to control the predators to kill the wolves, they actually called it going out and hunting Nazis. Um, so, um, but, um, but other, the, the other side of this, which I think is so important to remember, is that a lot, for every person that's out there that absolutely hates wolves to their absolute core, there's somebody else out there that thinks that wolves like breathe rainbows and <laughs> fart glitter and that everything is wonderful and that wolves are the greatest thing to ever happen to, to, um, to ecology and to, to us and, and all of this. And, and I think what that misses is that these animals are violent predators, right? Um, they take down prey on a daily basis or every other day or thereabouts. And, and when they do so, best case scenario, if you're an elk and, and you're being attacked by a wolf, best case scenario is that you're um, suffocated to death from the 1,200 pound PSI strength. That's twice the bite strength of the German Shepherd, right? The crushing uh, bite of, um, you know, on your throat from one of these wolves and you die over the course of 10 minutes while other members of the pack are eating the other half of you. That's best case scenario, right? And so imagine being out there and seeing this as a rancher, as a hunter, as somebody out there on this landscape and actually coming across this. Like, right, that doesn't, you know, that, that, that means something that's significant. And when that is applied towards, um, when that, that violence is applied towards your own livestock, um, it adds another level to this, right? There's a couple of major um, lobbies of groups that are very anti-wolf out west, and, and one of them is the livestock industry. And the other one is the elk hunting industry, the hunting industry. And I'm not gonna get into the elk hunting industry at all in, in the course of this talk, because that's a can of worms that I can, I'll talk about next year for next natural experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, 
because there's a lot of data there and, and there's a lot of graphs and figures and reasons why, why um, elk, hunt, elk hunters and wolves can get along. Um, but if you are a rancher and you live on the back door of Yellowstone Park and of these ecosystems, um, this is a real threat that you have, right? Um, wolves do kill things and it's not pretty. And if you walk out to your, uh, your, your cattle, you know, they may be grazing in public land, which is its own you know, can of worms to talk about whether or not that's something that should happen or not happen. Um, but you, know, you walk out to your cow or your horse and this is what you find, you know, that's, that's a problem. Um, and I'm just gonna take that slide away for a second. Um, so it doesn't happen very often, okay. Um, in Wyoming last year, there was 150 livestock depredations by wolves in all of Wyoming. There's four million cattle in Wyoming. So that gives you an idea of the proportion of, of this problem. Um, proportionally speaking, it's very, very, very rare. But if it happens to you, it's a really big deal, right? Um, and so there's a lot of animosity, not so much because there's a guaranteed you know, risk of your cows getting eaten, but because, you know, if you're a rancher and you're on the, the, foots, the, the doorsteps of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, this is what your backyard looks like. This is the Paradise Valley of Montana. All of that is the edge of the National Park and the edge of the, um, the Zorka National Forest, where there are, there's you know, healthy populations of wolves there. And right here, you're trying to you know, graze your cattle on your, on your land. Um, and you know you may or may not ever actually have wolves coming and eating your cows, but you're awake every night wondering if your cows are okay. You're paying extra money to have a cowboy out there with your cows on grazing land to make sure that wolves aren't taking your your cattle. You are constantly thinking about this actual threat, right? Um, if you allow me to get your hackles up even further right now, I would I would liken this to uh, think about a similar situation in our culture, right? The likelihood of a person being killed by a murderer is extremely low, but it's something that is is a serious thing that we that we think about in our culture, right? And and you know, so if you are raising cattle and you have personally delivered that calf from that cow in a cold barn on a January day two years ago, and you wake up and it's being eaten by a wolf, um, that's you know, that's that's a, a valid reason to to not really like these animals. So that's the that's the, the the political landscape, I guess, or like the cultural landscape behind uh, that, that was underpinning this idea to reintroduce these animals into Yellowstone in the first place in 1995. Imagine the challenges involved in trying to get a reintroduction off the ground when that is the prevailing attitude in the Western states, right? Um, it's incredible that it happened at all, and it took over 20 years for this to actually happen. So what happened from you know between the 60s and the mid 90s when wolves were introduced was a major change in our understanding of ecology. You know it used to be that what would be better for an elk than not getting eaten by a wolf, right? And that changed to our idea of understanding ecosystems and understanding keystone predators and understanding that the top a, a, you know, healthy predator populations keep prey animals in check keeps the entire ecosystem healthy, right? This idea of having all of the pieces of the puzzle in play allows for a healthy ecosystem. And that's where our understanding has evolved to in the last um, you know, 30 years or 40 years or so that enabled this interest in reintroducing wolves. So now the question is, if you want to reintroduce wolves, where do you get your wolves from if they're all exterminated, right? Um, there's wolves in Canada. Um, but do you think that Canadian culture around wolves is really any different than, than uh, Americans' culture around wolves? No, they're, they're hunted and persecuted up there just like down here. And so the Park Service in 1995 uh, went to Canadian trappers and they said, how much do you get for a wolf pelt? $500 for a good wolf pelt? Okay, we'll give you $1,500 if you bring us a wolf alive. To which basically they all said, the only good wolf is the dead wolf. Right. Um, and so the government had really not made much headway in actually getting um, wolves from Canada. So that's where this guy showed up. This guy's name is uh, Carter Niemeyer. And he grew up hunting, fishing, trapping, all this stuff. And he um, 
uh, worked for wildlife services for the better part of his career. He, his, he was thoroughly steeped in predator control and management, uh, killing coyotes, all this kind of stuff. Um, and he was sent up to, uh, by the Park Service up to Canada, and they told him, go up there and don't come back without a whole bunch of wolves. <laughs> and so he went up to the door of the main trapper who they had been liaising with, this guy named, uh, I think, Barry. Knocked on Barry's door. He said, uh, I'm here to give you money for live wolves. And Barry took him around behind the house and showed him two dead wolves in the truck and said, those are the only wolves I'm bringing you. Um, and so they got, you know, talking and heated words, I'm sure, for a while. And then, um, you know, Barry thought this guy, all he was was, you know, some, some Yankee Yahoo from the city that was coming up, didn't know anything about Western culture and, and you know, what, what these trappers were really feeling and, and what this was all about. And, uh, and so, he, so Barry said, all right, I'll tell you what. He takes the two wolves out of the truck and drags them into his living room, throws them down right on the carpet in the middle of the living room, and says, if you can skin out your wolf faster than me, I'll get you your wolves. <laughs> and so the, the reason that we have wolves in Yellowstone is because this guy beat this guy in a skinning contest to the name of wolves. Um, what Barry didn't know is that this guy had skinned about 6,000 coyotes in his career and he could do it blindfolded. And so he beat him six ways to Sunday. And Barry was impressed and said, all right, I'll get you your wolves. <laughs> So fast forward, you know, a few weeks, they uh, capture a bunch of wolves in traps, they collar them, they let the collar wolves go back out in the wild so that they would find their packs. Then they came in with helicopters following those radio collars. They, these are tranquilized, not shot. Um, they tranquilized all the wolves that they could in each pack. They put them in kennels. They flew them to Yellowstone to the Gardner airstrip outside of the park. And this was the famous day in 1995 where these wolves were brought back into Yellowstone through this, this kind of sacred archway. On the back side of this arch, this is called the Roosevelt Arch, on the back side of this it says the National Park Service motto, which is for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. Um, so take that however you want. But, um, <laughs> so the wolves are, are you know, in these vehicles here, and you can imagine everybody on the inside of this gate is cheering and hooray and all this. On the outside of this gate is, is a large uh, you know, kind of counter protest of all this, of people you know, up in arms, literally, uh, about all these wolves. You can imagine the security detail involved in transporting these wolves in these kennels um, you know, across the Paradise Valley and into, into Yellowstone, right? So they brought these wolves in on these, in these kennels, and they set them down into these, until the reacclimation pens. And each, they brought in, uh, there were three acclimation pens in the park, and they brought in one pack of each one of these acclimation pens in each one of the years. Um, and the reason for this is that, you know, wolves have no problem getting up and walking a thousand miles if they feel like it. So their biggest fear was that they would let these wolves out and they would walk right back to northern Alberta where they came from. Um, that was a real concern. And so instead they put them into these reacclimation pens, these acclimation pens that were very tall with fences that curled in on the top and they, they went way into the ground so they couldn't dig underneath them, right? And there they stayed for 10 weeks looking out through the, the chain link fence at elk walking around the hillside and smelling bison, you know, on the hillside. Uh, the Park Service would bring in um, carcasses of animals they could feed. <clears throat> and then um, 10 weeks later, they were released, and the, the fence was cut open, and they went out onto the landscape. And this is what was worried would happen, um, <laughs> was that these wolves would immediately take off, go over the park line, and just cause havoc among the ranching community immediately. But what actually happened was, for the most part, these wolves that were reintroduced into the park set up shop right there in Yellowstone, right um, around that acclimation pen. <laughs> so let's add some, some names, or I should say maybe some numbers, uh, to, to this story. This is where our dynasty is going to begin. This is wolf number nine. Um, and number nine was among the first wolves reintroduced into Yellowstone Park in 1995. This whole reintroduction, there's only 31 wolves. All this fuss that we have today about the wolves in Yellowstone and, and you know, the whole wolf population down west, this was sparked by the reintroduction of just 31 wolves, of which number nine was one of the very first ones to be brought in in those kennels. She was in one of those kennels in that picture that I showed before. So number nine and her mate, number 10, were reintroduced into this pen together. Right? When they cut open the pen, 
9 and 10, immediately left the park. <laughs> and they went here. They went um, 20 miles outside of the park um, to the eastern side of the Beartooth Mountain, the Beartooth Plateau, which on the one hand is extremely wild and extremely remote, but on the other hand has none of the protections afforded by being inside the national park. And furthermore, the other side of this, you know, if you kept going you know, across the road and down, you'd end up in Billings, Montana. So you are actually, as far as the West is concerned, in a, in a, you're near a pretty populated place where there's a lot of people that aren't too happy about wolves. So of course, number nine and number 10, they leave the park, they go over there, and number nine promptly gives birth to a whole bunch of pups in a den that she has dug way over on the eastern side of the Veritude Mountains. Um, with you know the lights of Billings off in the distance, and the Park Service says, "Oh no!" <laughs> but then it gets even worse because immediately after that, number ten is poached by someone. So number nine loses her alpha male, um, and so here's number nine with pups. And as a, uh, a, a female has just given birth to pups, you rely on the rest of your pack to bring food back to you um, and feed you and feed your pups. And so without another adult wolf around to provide. Those pups are doomed. Maybe number nine would be doomed too. So the Park Service said, well, this is not good. We better go get her. And so they went out there and they set a leg hold trap, a padded leg hold trap, to try to catch number nine. And um, they literally sat outside of a motel room in Billings with their radio telemetry antenna um, pointed up towards the mountains because when they, uh, the leg hold trap triggered, it would emit a signal. And so they're just waiting for this trap to get triggered. So the signal goes off, they go out, so they get number nine, and they go to pick up the pups, and there's no pups there. Um, so they look, and they look, and they look, and the pups are found three quarters of a mile away in a talus slope on the side of the mountain, a place that number nine had brought her pups to and stashed them there when she first scented that trapper, setting the trap to catch her. Right? So the park surface is up there on the talus slope, they're hanging you know, down to their ankles in talus with, with um, Leatherman pliers, reaching down as far as they can, pulling out wolf pups by the ear because they're so <laughs> far down in there. But they get them all, and they put them back into the reacclimation pens, and the Park Service sits down and thinks, okay, now what are we doing? Um, but before um, they could really get their wits about them, the Park Service, that is, a storm comes through, and 10 trees are felled over the top of this acclimation pen fence. And almost all of the pups get up and walk the trees and jump over, and <laughs> the pups are now stranded on the outside of the fence. And number nine is stranded by herself with one other pup inside the fence. And the park service is out there trying to catch the wolf pups and big nets, and they're just way too wily and fast. They can't do it because they've got them down and fast. And so the park service is like, all right, there's nothing we can do now except to just cut the fence open and let not number nine out and just hope it works out. The park service goes out there on the day to cut open the fence. They have the big cable cutters, and they look, and just next to the acclimation pen is another wolf out of nowhere, wolf number eight. And number eight was reintroduced into a different acclimation pen earlier on. He left his pack, was looking, you know, wandering across the landscape looking for mates, who knows, and he came across number nine in this acclimation site. And in this situation, anything could happen, right? This is a, a big, you know, uh, alpha male who is, um, who is coming across a bunch of pups that are genetically not related to him. Um, and a female inside that, that pen that could become a potential mate, right? And so, the Park Service is like, oh, what's going to happen here? And number eight goes over and starts playing with the pups. He starts rolling over on his, on his belly, and the pups are jumping all over him. It's very happy and fun, and number eight goes to the fence, number nine goes to the fence, and they're kind of muzzling and, and all this, and so everything seems great. And so the Park Service cuts open the fence, number nine leaves, number eight and number nine become a famous alpha male and alpha female pair of the Rose Creek pack, and together they um, raised litter after litter after litter of pups. And by, I think, 2004, 2005, about 75% of wolves in Yellowstone had some genetics related to wolf number nine. So this is a very famous matriarch. Um, so that's, so that's the, the first generation of this story. Remember that one pup that didn't leave the acclimation pen that stayed in there with mom? That was wolf number 21. That's the next wolf you're going to learn about here. 
school number 21. And, and 21, um, from a very early age, was different than the rest. He was regarded as a strong, brave, confident, powerful wolf. Even as a pup, <laughs> when the park service would come and they would put in uh, carcasses into the acclimation pen, all the wolves would always go to the other side of the pen and just cower against the edge. But number 21 would stand there between the family and the park service and just growl at them, <laughs> <laughs> defending his pack, even as a little pup. Um, and when all the other pups left the acclimation site, he stayed in there to defend mom, right? Um, a couple of years uh, after the acclimation pen part of his life, um, and he just just kind of a subordinate member of the Rose Creek Pack, um, the Druid Peak Pack, which is the next pack over, the next territory over. The Druids were uh, perhaps Yellowstone's most famous pack of wolves in history, largely because of the 21, which you'll learn about in a second. Um, the alpha male of the Druid Peak Pack was poached, he was shot by it by somebody just over the border outside of the park. And so it left a big power vacuum in the Druid Peak Pack. And number 21 leaves his pack, leaves the Rose Creek Pack, and waltzes straight into the Druid territory and right into the pack and says, I'm your new alpha male. And that is one of the most brazen things a wolf could possibly do, right? The leading cause of death um, for wolves um, is death by other wolf. Right? If you walk into another pack, you have a very good chance of being immediately torn to shreds by other wolves there. Right? Um, but here's 21 who walks right in, he senses that there is a need for, a leadership, for leadership, and he walks in, and, and immediately they cede power right to him, and he becomes the alpha, the alpha male of the Druid Peak Pack. Now, 21 is regarded as, uh, as like a super wolf. You know, a lot of folks say that he's like a fictional character, but he was actually real. Um, because he was extremely strong. He was extre an extremely good fighter. He was known to be able to fend off six other intruding wolves all by himself. I mean, done it on multiple occasions, fighting off wolves like Muhammad Ali or like Bruce Lee or something like that. Um, and, but for as tough and as strong as he was, his favorite thing to do was play with the pups. And he loved to let the, the, his pups roll all over him, and he loved losing play fights to his pups. Um, so he would you know, pretend to fall down and, and let the, the pups grab him by the neck and all this kind of stuff, and he would you know, admit defeats, and, and he just loved doing that. Um, and so that was kind of his, his um, you know, kind of fatherly expression. But in addition to his strength and his sensitivity, he was also regarded as magnanimous, because he never lost a single fight in his entire life. But he also never killed an opponent in his entire life either, which is really, really unusual. Um, so on one occasion, there was this wolf called 302. 302 we gave a better name called Casanova. And it was called <laughs> Casanova because it was this beautiful jet black male that had left his pack and was wandering around. And uh, the Drury Peak pack now is pretty much 21, his mate, and a whole bunch of daughters. And Casanova would, would kind of hang out in the periphery of the pack, howling up to the daughters like Don Juan, like serenading them, howling, howling. And the daughters would kind of come over and check him out. And oftentimes, if, a, if another male that's outside the pack comes in, that's another good reason for the alphas to come and just kill you on the spot. Um, because in a wolf pack, usually the only breeding members of that pack are the alpha male and the alpha female. Um, and all the other wolves kind of take care of the pups of the alpha pair. And so the alphas have a lot of um, skin, a lot of interest in making sure that other wolves in the pack are not diluting um, the pack's ability to take care of, of their pups. So 302 wears out his welcome a little bit with 21, and 21 runs him down, 130 pounds, big, huge, broad shoulders like a linebacker, and pummels him to the ground and starts tearing him apart. The rest of the, the Drury Peak pack comes in and is, is attacking him and fighting him, and, um, and then um, out of nowhere, 21 stops, and he backs off, and he kind of just looks at 302, and the rest of the pack stops and looks at 21, like, wait, I thought we were supposed to kill this guy, and, <laughs> and, uh, and 21 lets him go, and 302 just slinks off. So the, the, one of the directors of the Yellowstone Wolf Recovery Projects named Rick McIntyre, when he tells this story, at this point he likes to say, why did Batman never kill Joker? <laughs> Um, now, if you're answering that as a human, you'd say, because it's very impressive if you, as the victor, 
you know, vanquish your enemy and you, and you kill your enemy, that's impressive. But what's even more impressive is if you let that, that you know, enemy survive. It shows an incredible amount of confidence um, and, and mercy that you can let your enemies go. Okay, so I'll circle back to that in a second. So 21 um, and his mate, 42, they used to say that 20, 42 is twice the wolf that 21 ever was. <laughs> um, 42 was a remarkable uh, alpha female. She was an extremely good mother. 21 and 42 together um, reigned the Lamar Valley for years and years. They grew their pack up to 37 members. It was the largest wolf pack ever in recorded history, 37. And that was, that was a, <coughs> an artificially inflated pack size because there was a really, really high prey base. In that northern range of Yellowstone, where these wolves hung out, there was about 17,000 elk wandering the northern range. The carrying capacity for that habitat, that ecosystem, was about 3,000 elk. So in the absence of wolves, in the absence of grizzly bears, in the absence of mountain lions, um, the elk population in this ecosystem had really gone through the roof. And after the reintroduction of wolves, wolves could just look anywhere and oh, there's an elk, and there's an elk, and there's an elk. Um, and so it was uh, easy pickings for a long time. So here's the, the Druid Peak Pack 2142 with you know, just a, an endless supply of food all the time um, in their Lamar Valley. <clears throat> One day, um, the pack is traveling towards the edge of their territory and an invading pack comes in and 42, the mate of 21, is killed by the rival pack. She's ripped to shreds by the Molly's pack, the rival pack. And, um, and 21 sits down and howls for like two straight days. <clears throat> he had never been seen to do that ever before. No wolf watcher ever watched a wolf um, howl like that. <clears throat> if that's not warning, I don't know what it is. A few weeks after that, now uh, number nine, or sorry, number 21 <clears throat> is nine years old. That is like ancient for a wolf. The average lifespan of a wolf is like four to five years. Um, and uh, because you know, living as a wolf is tough. Around every corner, you're getting kicked in the head by an elk or getting attacked by another wolf, or there's all sorts of things out there. So wolves don't live very long. So number 21, he was nine years old. And um, one day, uh, wolf number um, 21, he, the pack was out hunting elk. And number 21 just sits down. The rest of his pack goes off without him. He turns around, and he starts walking the other direction. And he walks up onto the very tip top of this mountain right here. This is the Lamar Valley that we're looking down. <clears throat> and it took him a while to get up there because he was arthritic and moving slow. His mate had just been killed a couple weeks before. And he sits down there on top of that mountain and looks out over this territory that he had been the alpha male of for so long. And off on in one direction towards us was the reacclimation pen that he could see that was still there from when he was first released uh, into the park as a pup nine years ago. And off in the other direction, he could look down and see his den site where he had raised so many litters of pups at 42 and, and he had lived out so much of his life. And so sitting there on top of that mountain, looking out at this landscape, he also has a nose full of the scent of 42, whose scent was lingering in the sagebrush on the trees and on the, on the trail from having walked through there only a couple weeks before. And he curls up under a tree and he dies on his own terms after nine years of living out life as a wolf in Yellowstone. Shortly after that, the, the Druid Peak Pack more or less falls apart. Um, without that, that leadership, the pack goes, cycles through a couple of leaders, and Casanova comes back into the picture. And now, those daughters have no attachment to this pack necessarily. Casanova comes in, and 21's daughters leave with Casanova, and they go off and they start their own pack, the Blacktail Pack, which continued on for about 15 more years, the Blacktail Pack. And, Cas and Casanova actually became a really great alpha male very protective, um, great leader, all of this. Um, and the question is, back on that day when 21 let him go, did he know that it was because one day he wasn't going to be around anymore? And that by letting him live, he knew that, well, Casanova, I'm not interested in him right now, but one day he'd be a great mate for, for my daughters. And, and, and you know, take that however you want. But, um, but Number 21's genetics lived on through his daughters because of the pact they formed with Casanova after his death. So, so there's the emotional way we can describe this. There's also something that's 
seated deeply in evolution, um, where there is a resistance to, to killing that wolf. So that, now we're going to switch to another wolf. And this is wolf number 26, uh, sorry, 926. And we're fast forwarding a little bit. This is the granddaughter of 21. So the great granddaughter of number nine. Right? And 926 lived a very different life, very different life. Nine, uh, 21 was, was a fictional character, right? But he also lived in a fictional Yellowstone where elk populations were artificially inflated, um, where there was food everywhere. The ecosystem hadn't really come back into balance in terms of prey population versus predator populations. But also, uh, also wolves at, that, at the time of 21 were protected under the Endangered Species Act. Number 926 was born into a world um, after the wolves were delisted in 2011, and born into a world of wolf hunting. And a world where instead of there being 17,000 elk, there was 3,000 elk um, around her area. <coughs> So, um, so in the first year of her life, she was born in um, born in 2011. In the first year of her life, um, she watched her mother get, who was at the time the most famous wolf in the world. If you remember news articles a few years back about a famous wolf in Yellowstone getting killed uh, by a hunter, it was her mother, uh, my 26's mother. Her name was 06. She's also 832. But whatever. Um, so, uh, 926 in, in the same year, uh, in just her very first winter of life, watched her mother shot by a hunter and watched her uncle uh, shot by a hunter. This is a strange pack where her mother had scraped together <coughs> her own pack by her own will. She had found two brothers and made them both her alpha male because one wasn't good enough for her. Um, <laughs> and uh, and um, so, 926 kind of grew up with. Uh, early on with these kind of two fathers and one mother and in her first year of life watched mom get shot and watched one of her one of her fathers get cut, shot her uncle get shot after that happened um, the the pack kind of disintegrated there was a power vacuum that was left there was an intense amount of sibling rivalry that cropped up <clears throat> um, throughout this this period without without this leadership um, let me just get past that and um, so um, 926 had three older sisters that were kind of the, the generation above her. They were born in the previous year. And they all um, descended into a bunch of kind of sibling rivalry. Two of the sisters killed one of the others. Meanwhile, the surviving alpha male, he went out and found a new mate um, to try to restabilize the pack. And he brought his new mate back to the rest of the pack, and the sisters immediately killed her. And ousted the, the the alpha male, who gave up and he walked 15 miles south to a different valley on the other side of Yellowstone and started a whole new life, you know, just started over. Um, and so, so 926. This is her. This is her first year of life. Mother killed, uncle killed, father ousted, sister killed by her other sisters. Right? Um, just amazing differences between that and, and 21's life. And, and because of this, she just became known as, the, as like the little wolf that could. She had a remarkable amount of tenacity. And so wolf watchers started at one point calling her Spitfire. Um, because she was just, she was brazen. And she, she was just faced with so much um, adversity at every turn that she had no choice but to just face the bison head on and let it chase her away time and time again. So she was a... Um, <laughs> I'll let this go for a second. <laughs> I wish there's a grizzly bear over here too, by the way. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> what is it? Grizzly bear? Is it just lying down? So 926. The whole Lamar Canyon pack, this, their, this, her pack's name was uh, the Lamar Canyon pack, and they had replaced the Druid Peak pack. Still had a lot of genetics from 21, of course. Um, and uh, the Lamar Canyon pack just kind of disappeared off the radar screen for a while. And wolf watchers in Yellowstone were really biting their nails. It was tough as a guide because we go out there and knowing that there are no wolves in this valley right now, so it's going to be hard to find them. So we know that they're not there. They're outside of the park, they're, the pack is dissolving. And one day, 926, comes back into the park with this guy, a wolf called 925. 
Uh, but before he had a collar, we called him Big Gray. And uh, Big Gray was a big wolf from an outside pack. And, um, and they together got together in 925 and 926 had the pups, and they regained a toehold in the Lamar Valley after a couple of years of it being very, very scarce out there. So now um, 925 and 926 have been together for a year. They went out on an elk hunt. And it was 925, 926, and all of their yearling pups, right? So they had been born just a little less than a year before. And yearlings are pretty useless. They're not uh, experienced enough to fight. They don't know how to kill anything. They're not good hunters yet. They're, they're basically just kind of dead weight when it comes to, to the pack. And so here's 925 and 926, basically by themselves in terms of actually experienced wolves. And they're having to search farther and wider for prey because there's just less less elk to go around. And so they walk west and they walk out of the Lamar, Camp, Lamar Valley and they walk out of their territory and they walk in squarely into the territory of the Prospect Peak Pack and nearby rivals. And there they find an elk and there's a dramatic chase that ensues. And 925 and 926 are heading after this elk. The elk is perched up on the very, very edge of a very tall cliff. And often elk will put themselves in that situation backed up to a big cliff so that nothing can get around behind them. Right? And, and the elk will defend itself with its front, front feet. Um, 926 is about 90 pounds or so, and, and um, 925 is probably 120 pounds or so. And a full grown female elk is about 500 pounds. And, and wolves that are going after bull elk, which is common, are like 750. So these are animals that are like six or seven times bigger than them, right, that they're hunting. But the elk slips and it falls off of the cliff, and it lands at the bottom of the cliff. Um, squarely into the territory of the Prospect Peak Pack. <laughs> so shortly after they have gorged and filled their bellies, the Prospect Peak Pack catches something strange on the wind, and it's the scent of all the Lamar Canyon wolves in their territory. <clears throat> and so the Prospect Peak Pack was 12 wolves strong, Almost all of them were big, strong adults. And here's 925 and 926, full from a big, huge meal with a bunch of useless yearling pups. They're outnumbered and outgunned, and um, all these prospects are running at them. And so 925, 926, the rest of the pack, they take off running. The prospects are catching up. They're right on their heels. They're getting closer and closer and closer. The Lamars are losing ground. And um, in against, for, for reasons that, that you know, were, were hard to imagine, 925 stops dead, and he turns around and just stands there. Well, 926 and the pups just take off. He had let himself be taken down as bait by the prospects so that the rest of the pack could escape. The prospect is sent on him, they tear him to ribbons there, right on the spot. Some of the pups kind of circle around and try to draw off some of the, the, the prospect males. It doesn't work. Um, 925 is basically dead by the end of the day. But in doing so, 926, all the pups survived. They continued running for five miles before they slowed down. They made it all the way back to their den site. And now, um, all of the wolf watchers were thinking probably the same thing that 926 was, which is 926 was pregnant. And she was about to give birth to another litter of pups. And she just lost her, um, her, her alpha male, just like her great grandmother so long ago, number nine, right? And um, so we're wondering what could possibly happen. 926 is doomed, her pups are doomed. Just one week later, this is looking down to the north end of the Lamar Valley, the den site is basically over, over here. We hear howling coming from up in the mountains, and we look up, and on this side, right here on this cliff band, way up high, there's 926 and her pups, way up there, just hanging out on top of the cliff, why not? And we look up though, and they're not howling. It's somebody else that's howling. And, and they are deep, low, baritone howls that, that you know, an a alpha female and a bunch of pups um, wouldn't be able to make. And we look over, and 926 is also like, where is that howling coming from, right? Hearing howling coming from your territory when you're the only wolf, in that, when you thought you were the only wolf in your territory, is a little alarming, right? And then we train our scopes right over here to the other side of this canyon. 
and there are four big, huge male prospect wolves. Four of the same wolves that had just killed her alpha mate just a couple of days before. And they are locked under her and they see her. And there's a whole bunch of yearling pups there that are not related to those wolves. And 926 is about to give birth to a bunch of pups that aren't, that don't belong to these prospect males. And so it's getting dark, we're all biting our nails. 926 sees them and her and the pups take off running down the cliff and disappear into these trees. And the prospect males run down the cliff and disappear into the exact same spot. And then it gets too dark to see. <laughs> <laughs> And so, like, it was a very quiet dinner that night. We were wondering <laughs> what is going to happen at 926. Oh my gosh, can she not catch a break? And we wake up in the morning and we go out looking for 926. And this is what we find. We find her with the four prospects. This is not, this, you know what those wagging tails mean, right? Uh, I'm sorry for the uh, home video quality of this thing. But this is the four males and 926. They had come looking for a new friend. <laughs> this, but all four of these males were trying to compete with each other for which one 926 would love the best. And so this is a wolf called 965, this beautiful white one, who is dominating his, uh, one of his brothers called Twin, um, while 920, uh, 926 right here is not paying attention. She's like, whatever. <laughs> um, and so you know, basically 926 picks one of these, these males comes to an alpha female, has pups. You want that story to end happily, but over the next year, one by one, all four of these males die. One mm -hmm. dies to disease, one dies uh, in, a rival, in a battle with a rival pack, one just disappears off the map entirely, and one is shot by a hunter. And now it's 926, alone, again. The next season she goes out, she brings back another alpha female, or alpha male, her third alpha male, a brother was tagging along, um, and so uh, she's like, okay, this is my chance. They have pups together, all the pups die of mange. Mm. The elf, that, that male she brought back, dies of canine distemper. Mm. Now it's just her one daughter that managed to survive, and this brother that tagged along with the other alpha male, um, and, and that's it. So 926 has lost three alpha males. Her father was ousted from the pack. Her, uncle was killed, her mother was killed, her sister was killed by others, um, you know, just can't possibly catch a break, right? What happened to the youngsters? Um, they, all the pups basically died. Every litter of pups that she had kind of died mostly due to disease. The yearlings that, when these four prospect males showed up, the yearlings that were hanging around, the daughters didn't mind them at all, big, huge, handsome male wolves. But the male yearlings um, of 926, her, her sons, they weren't very interested in, in those prospects being the new stepdads. And so they left the pack, left the park, and were shot. Um, the so then it's 926, it's um, that male brother of this, the other alpha male. So there's, there's 926, there's another adult, and there's the daughter of 926, who's now a couple of years old. And they had kind of just disappeared off the radar screen. We kind of thought that they were dead. They we didn't know what had happened. On the rare occasion that we did see them, we didn't see any pups with them. We thought that this, this pack was just basically just you know uh, on its way out. And then in the middle of October, or just now a month ago, right, or a couple months ago, so this October, wolf watchers go out and they see uh, 926's daughter in the front of the pack. They're all walking across the Lamar Valley. There's the daughter in the front. Behind her is that other brother. And behind them is a whole bunch of pups. And behind them is 926. <laughs> and so now 926 is no longer the alpha female. She gave her, she kind of ceded her power to the daughter. And now 926 is a grandma. <laughs> I know that's really how you want the story to end. That's not how it ends, though. <laughs> so, um, so when I was preparing this talk, when I started to think about how I wanted to do this talk, um, 926 was still alive. Just about three weeks ago, 926 and her, and her pack left the park just over the border, and 926 was shot. Um, and yeah, I woke up one morning to this in the headlines, right? Um, so. Oh my gosh, so unfortunate that that happened. But 
for this particular wolf, is it really surprising that at the end of the day, this is how she met her end, with one more of these big, deep struggles like this, right? And, um, but, you know, in, in terms of the big picture, she had lived through everything. And what she finally got to see happen before she was killed was she got to see, uh, she got to become a grandmother. She got to see her daughter give birth to pups and continue the lineage of the Slamar Canyon Pack that started way back with number nine, and then with number 21, and then uh, through 06 into 926, into her daughter, and now these pups are still out there. When I head to Yellowstone in a couple, in a week from now, um, when we go out looking, we're gonna be looking for these pups, and we're gonna be looking for the daughter um, of 926 and, and her mate, right? <laughs> so, watching wolves is, is um, it's heartbreaking sometimes, right? Um, we want our stories to end nice and happily. The thing about watching wolves is that it's, it's not, you know, it's in a way it's watching a soap opera, right? And it's watching a play or an opera or something like that. Um, but the stories that we write tend to always have a, a nice, clean, tidy package where we wrap things up and we move on. And that's not what happens when you watch wolves because they live real lives, right? And they are honest lives. And when we watch their stories, we haven't prescribed what the end is going to be. And in a way, that's a much more um, uh, useful story because that's that's what life is actually like for, for us, right? You know, every single one of our struggles that we have uh, is hard earned, right? And you know, failure could be around any corner, and you know, it's 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 not always a happy picture and all this. Um, so I want to I want to just kind of um, button things up by putting this story of this dynasty of wolves into the larger picture so that we don't see 926's death by bullet as this tremendous tragedy that it seems like on the surface and instead look at it at, at the larger perspective. So first of all, um, I saved all my graphs and maps and stuff to the very end. <laughs> <laughs> when it all started, there was 31 wolves that were reintroduced. Mm -hmm. Now there's 1,700 wolves throughout mm -hmm. Northwest Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. Each one of these circles is, um, is a known wolf pack. <clears throat> the reintroduction, ecologically speaking, by all measures, has been a tremendous success. Um, and the presence of wolves in the landscape has um, surpassed the expectations of a lot of the biologists who originally did this in the first place. Um, wolves are hunted now, right? They're no longer in the Endangered Species Act. Um, the the states in this area, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, are not fond of wolves and are doing their darndest to eradicate as many of them as possible. But the thing is, wolves are here to stay because the Endangered Species Act basically stipulates that if, um, that, you know, if, if a population recovers to a certain degree, then the federal government stops managing that population and states can gain the rights to continue managing that. What that often means is that's when hunting starts on that animal, right? Um, but the caveat is that there has, there's a threshold number of wolves that has to remain in the landscape. And if that threshold uh, fails to be met, then the federal government regains control of the management of that species. And for as much as folks in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, in you know, the political side of things, are really against wolves, the one thing that they hate more than wolves is the federal government taking over their ability to manage those wolves. <laughs> um, and so wolves are here to stay. And despite the intense hunting pressure, um, although hunting pressure on these wolves changes their pack dynamics dramatically, think about what a hunter's bullet did to fracturing the Lamar Canyon pack um, to 926's mother, and what it did when she was shot, right? It changes the dynamics of packs. But overall, the numbers of wolves have remained remarkably steady no matter how many of them end up getting shot. This is the numbers from Idaho. Uh, wolf hunting started in Idaho in like 2010 or maybe 2009 um, over there. And uh, there's a few hundred wolves shot every year in Idaho. And this is the wolf population. It is kind of rock solid right in the, in the 700s. Um, wolves are resilient. And wolves are, wolves are very good at controlling their own numbers, much better than we are. Um, wolves are a lot better at finding each other than hunters and trappers are. And if wolves um, start eking into each other's territory, they kill each other. Um, and 
uh, and they spread out and cover more territory as necessary. So they ebb and flow and take care of their own numbers um, really, really <coughs> well. And if there's a vacancy in an area, then gosh, there's a lot more pups that survive the next year. And so the wolf populations are very steady, they're not going anywhere. So that's kind of the upshot of the, of the, the numbers side of the game of the wolf reintroduction. And ecologically speaking, the reintroduction has been a huge success as well. Right? <clears throat> um, this blurry graph here, you don't need to read, you just have to see the shape. This is years down here. This starts in the 60s, and it goes up basically to today. And what this is showing is the number of elk in the northern range of Yellowstone, way up here at 20,000, and then down here at uh, 4,000 here. And what you see is that in the absence of wolves, wolves are eradicated from the ecosystem and bears and mountain lions, the elk population really started to skyrocket. Wolves are reintroduced to the ecosystem right about here. Um, and, um, and you can see the elk population has come down since. Now, um, a really important takeaway is that wolves get all the blame for killing all the elk every time. Um, people think that um, wolves have killed all the elk. Oh my god, there's not going to be any elk left um, because all the, all the wolves killed them all. And, and while wolves have contributed to the decline in the elk population from this artificially inflated number down to the carrying capacity, simultaneously with the wolf reintroduction has been a, um, a dramatic increase in the number of grizzly bears in the population, the number of mountain lions, both of which contribute more to elk mortality than wolves do. So it's a whole ecological system that's at play here. It's the reintroduction of all the predators uh, and the stability of all the predators, not just wolves. But wolves have contributed to the decline in elk numbers, such that we're seeing changes in the landscape. Now, if you've seen this video that's going around called How Wolves Change Rivers, and the video goes something like, um, you know, there was a time back in the Dark Ages when wolves were all killed and everything was horrible. And then the wolves were brought back and the elk came back, and the skies cleared up, and the waters flowed clean, and the beavers returned, and the songbirds started singing, and the truffula tree is sprouted out of the ground, and all that stuff, right? And, um, and, and the narrative of that is that wolves have fixed everything immediately in the last 20 years of their reintroduction. And, and you know, as you suspect, it's, it's never that simple. And um, wolves haven't fixed anything. This is a big, big, uh, there's, there are major changes to the ecosystem in the absence of all of these, uh, in the absence of predators, and that can't be fixed in 20 years. But things are moving in the right direction. This is a shot of the confluence of the Lamar River in, I think, in like 2000 or something like that, and this is that same area last year, and it moves for scale. Um, so, <laughs> so the fact that there's so many willows regenerating here. It's really promising. A re re uh, return of riparian vegetation in an area that had been heavily browsed down to the extent that moose can actually come back into the northern range of Yellowstone in numbers that they haven't really been able to for, for quite some time. Um, going back, this is a shot of a particular aspen grove um, in 2006 and again in 2010, <clears throat> showing that with fewer mouths feeding on vegetation, um, a lot of these. Aspen stands that have been able, have been having a hard time regenerating are now able to to kind of reproduce in those those um, saplings and get up above the, the browse line. So we're seeing trends in the right direction. Not quite like the, the magical unicorns and rainbows thing that you see, um, but we're moving in that direction, which is really really great. And then in terms of our relationship with wolves, this reintroduction has changed that quite a bit too. We never expected that there would be a wolf watching economy in Yellowstone. Biologists thought that we'd really reintroduce wolves into the landscape, and that's the last we'd see of them, because they don't like people, it's a tremendously huge place, and they, we thought they would live out their lives in private. And what was never expected is that they would live out their epic lives right in front of us for us to be able to watch. And, um, and as a result, people like Carol can come to Yellowstone and become inspired to write children's books. And people in Vermont on a cold day can come and learn about wolves um, and imagine what it was like for them to be uh, out there or for wolves to be here for that matter, right? Um, let me just bounce back. Also, we're, trying to, we're, we're getting better at figuring out how to handle the relationships between 
um, the different factions of, of people that do and do not like wolves. We're paying out large sums of money to livestock ranchers who lose their cattle or sheep due to wolf depredations, defenders of wildlife, and state game management agencies spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year paying out livestock losses. And in Wyoming, they pay ranchers seven to one for what the cow was worth at the time that it died. Um, uh, and so, you know, the financial loss of wolf livestock conflict is becoming more and more moot. There's obviously a lot buried in that bullet point that we don't have time to unpack. Um, but, um, but suffice it to say that you know, we're learning how to figure out this conflict. This is one of my favorite shots of wolves um, in Yellowstone. This is um, a wolf called 889. I'm not gonna tell you anything about her other than that she is the descendant of the Crystal Creek wolf pack. The very, very first pack to be reintroduced. Her, her ancestor uh, was the first paw to be put down after 70 years absence in Yellowstone. And that happened right there at this mm -hmm. reunion. And so here is, you know, this wolf, six or seven generations out from when her ancestors were released, on a landscape where you can see this tremendous amount of aspen regeneration right here, um, in between where she is now and where her family came from, which I think is just a really beautiful shot. So, like, what's the upshot of this, and why why do we care so much about watching wolves? <clears throat> You know, again, we, we really want that story of 926 to end happily, um, and it doesn't. Um, but that's that's significant. For all that 926 went through in her life, you know, she really demonstrated that for wolves, the attitude is looking forward, looking ahead, and saying, what's next? What problem can I overcome today? And perseverance is really the currency of, of survival, right? And... Um, and that victories are not really measured in a single day by what happens to one pup or with one bullet or something like that, but it's, it's measured over really long periods of time. You know, the fact that you know, 926 was shot, you know, how lucky are we that there was a wolf there to be shot in the first place, in a sense, right? Um, wolves have been exterminated, and now they're not. Now they're here to stay, and, and that's a victory, right? Um, and, and I think, <coughs> Maybe as an ecologist, the, the takeaway that I have from watching wolves is something that applies so poignantly to our lives as humans, is that um, the landscape that is the healthiest is often the one that contains the most amount of conflict in it, right? Um, and that seen over long periods of time, in the overall trajectory of history, um, you know, that's how you measure victories. And I think that's what Aldo Leopold is getting at back in, 19, in the 1960s, he had the first uh, inklings, the first thoughts of reintroducing wolves. And he said, only the mountain has really lived long enough to listen objectively to the howl of the wolf. Thank you. Um, if you want to sneak out, you're welcome to. I'm happy to answer it. Mm, oh, that's okay. Let's see if I can remember both those questions long enough to answer both. Um, so, the uh, first question was Are llamas being used as uh, guard animals, essentially, in, in, um, in like sheep herds and stuff? You know, guard, guard, uh, llamas make better guard dogs than dogs. You didn't know that. Um, and, and guard llamas are, are being used. I've seen them out there, and it's really fun to go buy a herd of sheep and double take and say, That's the sheep. Because <laughs> they're, they're very defensive of their, of their pack. Um, but, you know, even guard animals get killed by wolves once in a while. Um, so guard dogs and guard llamas, it's, it's not a surefire thing. Really what has been a surefire thing is um, the concept of range riders that are known as cowboys. Um, paying, paying a ranch hand to go out there and be with your cattle. A lot of the times these uh, livestock interactions between wolves are happening not on the rancher's back step, but out on public land. Land that belongs to all of us where ranchers are paying a couple dollars a head per, per cow 
to put them out there and leave them there, and then pick them up in the fall when they're nice and fat, right? Um, and so, you know, we could talk for days about the politics of that and, and whether that's antiquated and how we should change these laws. But um, at the end of the day, one thing that's been very effective is instead of just kicking your cows out the door in the spring and bringing them back in the fall, essentially, um, to go out to, to pay a ranch hand, a, a cowboy, to go out there and stay with them. And just the presence of humans around, around those, those cattle um, is almost a surefire way to prevent uh, livestock depredation. The second question we had was about climate change in relation to wolves. And one really um, poignant one that's being studied uh, intensely right now through the University of Wyoming, a fellow uh, named Arthur Middleton has been doing a ton of research on this that's been picked up by National Geographic a lot, um, has to do with elk populations. And so, you know, uh, what is it? As do the elks, so go, so do the wolves, or something like that. Um, the wolf population, the elk populations are using the landscape very differently um, than they once did, um, or have different pressures than they once did. The northern range of Yellowstone, which is where the Lamar Valley is, right? Um, that's not a place where prey species spend their whole lives. They go up, that, that's high country summer range, with nice, fresh, beautiful grass in you know, late May and June and July. <coughs> Um, and so elk migrate there to be there to feed on it and then leave. The northern range of Yellowstone is eight degrees Fahrenheit hotter uh, on average than it was just 25 years ago. And as a result, the, the amount of time in which grass is actually green there is a lot less by the order of a few weeks. So, you know, if you've spent much time in, in, in Wyoming or Montana, summer doesn't last very long. It's like, Winter, 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 spring, summer, fall, winter, 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 <laughs> right? Um, and so you don't have very many weeks to fit in all of the feeding you need to do to get ready for the next winter. So the loss of three weeks of nice green forage uh, make, makes a big difference. And so as uh, so that has implications for the survivorship of elk, therefore the numbers of elk that are in, in the ecosystem to be preyed upon, and also has, and as elk shift their distribution that shifts the distribution of where wolves have to spend their time and when. Um, I don't know that the, the thread of um, how wolves have been affected by that has been fully elucidated, um, but there's been tremendous impacts on, 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 uh, to the elk um, by warming temperatures in the northern range. <coughs> Thanks. Yeah. I was curious about the, when, when you said the, when you had that chart of the, uh, <coughs> the population of the, the elk, I was wondering if there was uh, impact of just, just overpopulation and, and disease as well as the grizzly bears and the, and the other predators. Almost like a boom-bust thing where yeah. at some point if there's too many elk, then there's going to be a massive starving die-off or something yeah. like that. Yeah, well, and, and I think, um, you know, that the population did fluctuate a lot because they were so far over capacity that in cold winters there'd be massive die-offs that you don't necessarily get when there's lower populations. Um, you know, I don't know if there has been a lot of studies looking at whether the overpopulation itself was a cause of their decline. Um, um, but the, the key takeaway for, for that that research in that, in that time period when the population did start to decline is that those numbers were coming down as a result of um, predators being back in the landscape um, to uh, higher numbers and uh, major changes in the regulations around elk hunting. That number, the, when the elk, that, um, that graph spiked way up in the beginning in the 60s, that was because we were actually managing elk basically in the same way that we manage cattle, right? You're raising elk to go shoot them. Um, and so our philosophies around game management have also have also changed over the years, um, and uh, and so there's it's a lot more complicated than just you know um, there were no wolves therefore the graph goes up and then there were were wolves and then therefore the graph goes down it's you know it's it's a gray area yeah um, yes um, you said wolves are here to stay and then your point about federal government acting as a deterrent to states because mm -hmm. they don't want to lose control of managing the wolf for the federal government. How much is that have to change under an administration? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Endangered Species Act so far has um, has held on 
And that's really the, the floodgate that would change everything. The most important piece of environmental law that is out there, period, is the Endangered Species Act. If you're wondering how you can do your part to support wolves or um, support you know, wildlife in general and just support you know, uh, responsible wildlife management and all these things, um, defending the Endangered Species Act is a really good place to start right now because that, that is being, um, there are attempts to erode that away, right? Um, so if there's no Endangered Species Act, then there's no more a disincentive for the states to not kill all of their um, delisted species, right? Um, so keep an eye on the Endangered Species Act, um, and when you see that in the news, pay attention to that, and, and that's, um, that's a really good place to invest your attention if you're a wildlife. Would it help to, to right now call our representatives and members? Yeah, I think so because... Just register our support? I, I think that's, that's a really smart idea. You know, I think that a lot of folks don't understand the power that the Endangered Species Act actually has. Um, it's, it's an environmental law that has a lot of teeth, and it muddles up a lot of um, you know, government progress in a very good way. Um, and, you know, for the benefit of things like wolves and grizzly bears and all that. And so, but, but that's not something that's necessarily recognized by politicians who usually, you know, environmental issues are not their very top priority. And so it may not be understood that, that the Endangered Species Act is, it's not just one of the many acts out there. It is like the thing that is the most important act for, for wildlife um, preservation, at least endangered species. Yeah, okay. So I think that would be a, a wise thing to do. Yeah. All the watchers of the wolves, don't the wolves then learn to be unwary of humans so that when they wander out of the park, they're basically sitting ducks for mm -hmm. the hunters? Mm -hmm. um, before I answer that question, it reminds me to remind you to check out in the back corner of the lobby out there are a whole bunch of articles. Um, that I put out. Half of them are articles about the, that were published in the 19, early 1990s before the reintroduction actually happened, about what was going on politically, what was the scene, what was the, the, the culture around this. Um, they're all local papers from Montana and Idaho and Wyoming. The other stack of papers is all about, is all modern headlines um, about what's going on. One of the, a couple of those papers address your question, which is, um, you know, from a population standpoint, a wolf is a wolf is a wolf. Um, a wolf in Yellowstone is no more important, ecologically speaking, than a wolf that's in the Beartooth National Forest, the Zork National Forest, right? Um, but when it comes, but but um, but a wolf is not a wolf when it comes to the amount of ecotourism dollars that that wolf brings in, for instance, right? Um, you know, our, should we treat the wolves in Yellowstone differently from a management perspective than wolves outside of the park? And the other piece that's really important to think about is. Is the behavior of wolves different in Yellowstone because they have grown up essentially around people? The Lamar Canyon dense site is like an eighth of a mile away from a road. Um, and so anytime the wolves want to bring food back and forth between pups and elsewhere, they have to cross the road. They spend all day long with a thousand people standing on, this, on these weird strips of asphalt pointing big telescopes up at them. Um, and, and that is just part of their life. They get used to that. That said, wolves generally don't want anything to do with us. And if you're out in Yellowstone and you leave that asphalt and start walking towards the wolves, they'll get up and walk half a mile away, right? Um, but there are plenty of times where wolves walk right in front of a car, or um, they, you know, they're not, they don't nearly have the, um, the fear of humans that wolves outside the park do because they haven't grown up with them. And so, you know, 926, when she was shot, was basically walking right down the road near Cook City. Um, so to her, what's the difference between walking down the road there and walking down the road five miles back, you know, near the site? Um, and, and that brings into question, you know, one of the, the tenets of, of hunting in our country, which is, you know, the idea of fair chase. Um, if you're going to hunt an animal, you know, it has to be a hunt and not just, you know, going to the grocery store and picking up your wolf next to the pork aisle, right? Um, there has to be an element of, of actual challenge to this and has to be, you know, a fair fight. Um, and is it, are the wolves in Yellowstone sufficiently different that it's no longer fair chase to hunt them um, at the borders of Yellowstone because a wolf that's walked over the boundary from Yellowstone is, is going to behave differently than a wolf that grew up living outside of the National Forest away from people. So it's not an answer question, is the 
short answer of all of, all of that. Um, there remains to be seen. One thing that did happen after uh, wolves were delisted and then 06, the most famous wolf in the world, was shot within a couple of weeks, is there's a huge amount of pressure to put quotas uh, along the borders of Yellowstone. Um, so even if hunting couldn't be closed at the border, um, the harvest numbers could be reduced. So now along the northern edge of the park, the quota is um, you know, off the northeastern side, the quota is two wolves, off the, northwestern, off the northwestern side is two wolves. And two wolves is a lot better than unlimited quotas, but two is enough for 926 to get shot, for instance. So, so it's a good step in the right direction, and I see it as a great act of, of compromise. You know? um, um, How many people work in Yellowstone on wolf um, dynamics, and does every wolf that's like born in Yellowstone get numbers? Um, not every wolf. About something like thirty percent of wolves in the park wear radio collars at some point in their life. Um, the wolves that don't wear radio collars uh, don't get numbers, um, but often there's an effort to to radio collar the alphas of the pack, because if you follow the alphas around, you're likely to have most of the rest of the pack around as well. Um, there are uh, some great crews of people who do amazing. Are any of you here tonight? Any wolf crew people? We're talking to some of you. Okay. <laughs> so there's no one fact check me. <laughs> um, there are some absolutely remarkable uh, wolf crew technicians that go out every winter and they spend, um, there's some focused wolf studies where there's a crew of people that go out, and there's a team of three people that's assigned to every single pack in the park. <clears throat> and, um, and they spend basically sun up to sundown every single day, regardless of the weather, regardless of the temperature, um, with eyeballs through spotting scopes on those wolves if they're in view, um, recording every little movement they make, everything they do. Um, and so there's, there's a ton of time invested in, in watching that and in collating that. And then above all that, there is a, uh, a team of, of you know, National Park Service biologists who are kind of collating that data. There's Doug Smith, who if you've seen a guy in a handlebar mustache with a Park Service hat talking about wolves, that's Doug Smith. And there's a couple other people that are also head biologists on all this. Um, but it's, you know, it's a fairly small crew other than that. In addition to the National Park Service, there's also all the, there's, you know, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has their wolf people, and USGS has their wolf people, and the state game agencies have their people, and so there's, there's a big, um, you know, collaborative um, network of, of wolf biologists that, that work together on this stuff. Another long answer to what should have been a short one. No, no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear the lot of people. <laughs> yes. Are there any other healthy wolf pack areas in the states besides in Yellowstone? Um, so Minnesota and Wisconsin and um, Michigan have larger wolf populations than the West does. Um, you don't hear about it because you never see them. Um, that you know the area is forested. You can't just go out and set up a spotting scope and look over five miles of landscape until you find them, um, which makes it sound easier than it actually is. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, those those states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, they never actually lost their wolves. They were never extirpated. Um, they were always there all along. They had been harvested down to the brink of extinction, I believe. But they they returned on their own. Um, through exchange from Canada. So it's, it's a continuous population from Canada down in. And there's, there's essentially a continuous population now in the west from Canada down into Montana. And so um, there's genetic exchange all the way through. The wolf that was, did I say this already? A wolf that was trapped in northwest Wyoming was re just found at the edge of the Grand Canyon a couple years ago. Um, so when I said that wolves can get up and walk a thousand miles, like that's, like they, that's an example of it, walking from Yellowstone to the Grand Canyon. Any in Maine? I don't think there are any in Maine. No. Yeah, I think it's a matter of time. Well, um, the, the wolf conversation in the East is, is tricky because um, a lot of our, our coyotes have a lot of wolf genetics in them. Yes. Um, and uh, and that's, that's an ongoing area of research, certainly, to figure out what does that actually mean. Is it that wolves and coyotes are actually interbreeding somewhere, or is it that you know these are self-breeding populations of these things that at one point got wolf mixed in. Um, but you know there are, there are wolves in Ontario. Um, they're not very far away. Um, and you know in some I do wonder you know if they show up in now and again. Um, and I think it's just a matter of time until 
you know, they might be found more regularly. I think that wolf um, populate. I think it's it's unreal. A lot of debate around this, around you know, the, is the is there a place for wolves in the Northeast, um, in the Adirondacks, in Maine, and you know, we could all share our opinions on that forever. Um, I think that wolves are hard to live with. And if they're hard to live with out west, where there's nobody anywhere out there, um, then they're, I think they're, they would be impossible to live with here. They might do fine, um, you know, hunting white-tailed deer in the Adirondacks. Like they, we could have a population, um, but I think, you know, is it worth the incredible amount of um, headache that that would that would cause? It would be. I think the, the stories out west would be a drop in the bucket compared to uh, having wolves in our own backyards, you know, on Hunter Mountain or something. I'm just kind of speculating, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> no one has a question about a slide, but for your four slides back, hey, the one with, with the Crystal Creek uh, wolf that you said was your favorite photo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one. Yeah. What was your question? Uh, there's a little bear, and then there's something like. Oh, good eye. See if you can tell me what that is. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, there's a there's a bison right there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Bison. Bison there and all this stuff. Um do you explain like how the loss of like one individual population would really have an effect? So I was wondering, are there any studies being conducted about the, the original Canadian population that these wolves were taken from and how that has changed as a result of the reintroduction. Yeah, there's like a whole other side of this whole reintroduction story. <laughs> yeah, it's this beautiful game to the, the Yellowstone ecosystem. But like, up in Canada, somebody's missing some wolves up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't think there's been any, any study at all on what that process did to that, those local areas. Wolves were taken from uh, essentially the edge of Wood Buffalo National Park. Um, or is that what's, you know, it's a Canadian National Park um, called Blue Buffalo National Park, and uh, and you know there was um, you know 31 wolves taken from that. So that's not a huge number considering when you know there's hundreds and hundreds of wolves harvested in legal hunts down here. 31 is, is in the sense a drop in the bucket, unless it was part of your pack. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I was actually really curious about that myself as I was putting all this together. I was thinking, wait a minute. No one ever, no one ever said what happened to the rest of the wolves in Canada. So yeah, I'm curious as well about that. Yeah. Do people who shoot wolves do you do they do anything with them? Can you use a poke for poke? Can you eat them? Can you? Um, you can't really eat them. It's a it's a trophy. So you're you're hunting it for the pelt or for the taxidermy or something like that. Um, and man, and you know, shooting a wolf is not just shooting a wolf. It's like you know, there's a lot of different reasons why one might shoot a wolf, but you know, like I said before, a wolf is more than just something with a whole bunch of fur on it. You know, it's more than just 100 pounds of meat with fur on it. It's it's symbolic. You know, and in the early days of wolf hunting, when they were delisting, that first hunt happened. Um, there was a surprising, statistically significant amount of Yellowstone wolves that were harvested right over the border. Um, you know, the number of wolves that were wearing radio collars in Yellowstone, I said, is about 30%. Um, more than half of the wolves that were harvested that were Yellowstone wolves were wearing radio collars. I didn't say that very well. But a disproportionately large number of the Yellowstone wolves that were shot over the border were wearing collars. So the question is, were those wolves actually targeted? Um, you have know, all these wolves to choose from throughout the, North, throughout the Northern Rockies. Um, are, are, you know, are folks going out to target collared Yellowstone wolves? Um, because shooting that wolves, those wolves mean something different. It's a statement. Um, so add another layer uh, to the to the complexity of our of our feelings around wolves, and think about um, the dynamics of of Yellowstone and wolves that were shot. In that early hunt. Can the hunters hack into the the collars? <clears throat> Not easily, but um, yeah, there's there's definitely a uh, a you know uh, like a wolf hunting website that said as much as, you know, if you have the ability to turn on a radio receiver to your channels to this range, to the frequency, um, and start scanning. Um, and so I think it's, it's very, I, you know, I don't want to, I certainly don't want to paint every wolf hunter, you know, in that light. There's a lot of folks that I think are really good people that hunt wolves. I don't, I 
agree with them, um, but they're nice people and everybody has their own reason for doing things. One of the things I really don't understand is, is you know, tuning in a radio antenna to the frequency of a wolf so you can, you know, so no fair chase there. Um, and that's never been, you know, officially confirmed, but, but it happened. <laughs> yeah. But you're only collaring the alphas and not those are the bigger ones, right? So um, more well, so, so you said that, you know, you're calling the alphas, the alphas are bigger, so wouldn't that be a better trophy, right? The only thing that matters is the pelts. When you wear a collar, it wears all the fur off of your neck. So the pelt is actually ruined. You can't get anything for a pelt that's been wearing a radio collar um, because the, the fur is not intact in the neck. Um, and so it's a, it's a choice, you know, to shoot a collar wolf or a non collar wolf. And if you're shooting one with the collar, assuming you, there are other wolves there, you need the decision to do that. Yeah. And, and it does cost the researchers a lot of money. You know, and each one of those, uh, each one of those radio, each one of the telemetry radio collars, ones that just submit a beep, costs about four thousand dollars when all is said and done to put on an animal. GPS collars that they wear cost about twenty thousand dollars when all is said and done to put on. Between the technology, hiring the helicopter, the ketamine tranquilizer, all the stuff that goes into, you know, the whole process of the collar and operation, um, it's it's a lot of money um, investing in these collars. So it's a big hit to research um, when when we lose collar holes. Why was there a data gap in the 80s on your farm? On the elk gap there? Um, I think there was just a couple of years where they couldn't do the, that survey. Um, I don't know if it was just bad weather or if it was, if it was something else, but um, I think it was just lack of data because they couldn't get out and do the elk survey. Or lack of funding or something. Yeah. So there were, there were elk. It didn't sound like good at zero. <laughs> <laughs> it was just that there was no, there was no uh, survey conducted that year. Um, uh, well, so I'll, I'll kind of dismiss class and I'm happy to chat with you afterwards because I just saw you have another question. Um, I'll remind you that we still have one more space in our Yellowstone trip in May. If you're curious about that, send me an email, sean at northbranchnaturecenter.org. Um, and then please do check out all the wolf literature and stuff in the back corner. I think it'll be a little more enlightening after knowing what you know now. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you.